to whom we sell our products. And they have literally been in court seven to ten years. So, this commission is composed of some of the leaders from the Judiciary Committees of the Senate and the House, the high-ranking people from Justice Department and Federal Trade Commission, and some lawyers selected from various points and backgrounds by the President. They've been meeting all oh, for the last couple of months. We've attended those sessions. We have filed statements setting forth NFO attitudes with respect to the Kaepernick-Volstead Act. The report will be released, at least the initial report, will be released sometime in the next 30, 60 days. Let us remember, they probably will take or recommend actions affecting some of these other segments of the economy, and it's almost a sure bet that some of the members on that commission will think they're doing the American public a favor if they question the operation of our milk order system the marketing order system as it affects milk. And they probably will ask that someone take a look at the Kepper Volstead Act from the standpoint of volume or size or geographic layout over the country. In our office, at this time, we're reminded of that old adage, you know, let them get a little closer and let's wait till we see the whites of their eyes. We think we want to see what kind of recommendations they're going to make for two reasons. They may make a recommendation or two that will be helpful to the NFO. And secondly, they cannot monkey with the Capra Volstead Act without putting it through the Congress. We will have plenty of time to work on that one. And I think it's safe to assume that if they do try any serious restriction or modification of the Capra Volstead Act, that you will find practically all of the bargaining and cooperative organizations, regardless of their political stripe or color or inclinations, working together back there to protect Capper Volstead. So in summary, I would, I would say to you, let's be calm. Let's see what's put out. If you start reading some reports on it, be sure you know where they come from. Maybe we ought to wait for Ben Stong and the reporter to give us the word, and then we'll plan some action and what to do about it. But I, I, I must tell you that if this one opens up for a real fight in the Congress, we'll have a job on our hands if that thing comes along at a time when the meat counter prices are rising and people are concerned about inflation and having a little trouble paying for their groceries. We just as well be frank about it. We just as well recognize the atmosphere in which we will be working. Orrin Lee, I didn't mean to uh, hang crepe or sound discouraged. We've got a lot of friends in the Congress. And it might surprise you to know that even in some of those districts and Senate races where they turned over, we lost a few friends, but we also gained some. So I believe we will have a good shot in this next Congress in Washington. Be happy to hear from you anytime you have a problem. You can pick up the phone or use the mails or come at us through Corning. We're always glad to hear from you, and we hope we're able to give you some pretty good service on some of the problems. Have a good Christmas and a good season. Let's go out and get the members. Let's go out and get some more commodity committed. We're going to need it. Thank you.
Thank you, Orn Lee. I'd like to spend about five minutes just briefly recapping what the field staff department has been involved in <clears throat> in this past year. We started out here, as many of you know, at the convention last year in Omaha with a young farmers meeting. There were some thousand people in that meeting and we went on from there recruiting those young staff people as they wound up to be in a young farmers national staff organizer program. Went on and had about 5,000 more to come into the home office during the winter. And again, we recruited more people, put them on the National Staff Organizer Program, and they went out and held meetings with other young farmers across the United States. Also, we put together a 16-county structure that went back, reworked with counties, helping hold county meetings, and that structure is still intact. Also last year at the convention, as you remember, Secretary Berglund announced that he was going to tell the people in FHA to have a moratorium on foreclosures. And Orrin Lee announced that we were going to set up a credit structure across this country to be sure that that was enforced. Throughout the year, the department has worked with 242 counties, 242 county credit committees. We have helped get, coordinate, and retain over $200 million worth of loans. And those loans range from seventy-five dollars to $300,000. But as we went through the young farmer meetings, and they continued as they continued throughout the year, we started to find out different things. We talked about them briefly last year. The young farmers that don't have an allegiance to a political party or farm organization. What we want to know is, what have you got? Do you have a plan? Do you have the brain power, if you will, to carry out that plan. And if you can sell them that, then they want you to tell them what they have to do to make the plan work. And while talking to those people within the last three or four months, we come across something else that I guess all of us knew, but nobody re really realized that I don't believe in agriculture we have a generation gap because you have the same problems as we have, but we do definitely have an economic gap, which is very, very prevalent. And what I'm talking about is for some of the older members in this auditorium and farmers all across the country who bought their land, got started in farming back in the 40s and the 50s, before inflation became as prevalent as it is today, there is an attitude of, well, I bought that land at $200 an acre, and now it's worth eight, a thousand, twelve hundred dollars an acre, and I've got equity, and I can ride it out. But while inflation has done that for you, it has turned on us. And what I'm talking about is that inflation, while the land has gone up, the land that we buy, the interest has gone up with it. And that creates an economic problem. The problem is our cash flow. Now, everybody's got the problem but it is hurting the young producers of this nation worse than anybody because they don't have enough equity to cover and borrow enough money to keep a cash flow going. I want to put up on the overhead two examples of what I'm talking about. 
And I want to explain that this is not my figures. These figures came out of a government study on the economic change in rural America. They took in 15 states, and we'll discuss this, what I'm going to show you now, at length Thursday night at the Young Farmers Meeting. They took in 15 states average 50 farms, not the small farms, not the extremely large farms, but the average farms in those states, predominantly the commodities that are produced in those states, and ran an average investment, an average indebtedness. The first one that we have, can you see that or should I dim the lights? Can we dim the house lights? I don't guess we can. <laughs> okay. What they done, they took the average, as I was saying, on investment in land. And the two I'm going to show you are Iowa and Nebraska. In Iowa, a 320-acre farm, the land investment when this study was done, which was last year, averaged $619,200. The machinery investment averaged $146,948. The improvements, $68,110. And the livestock investment at that time was $13,300. Now to break that down to find out what kind of a cash flow you would need to operate that average farm in Iowa. What I'm talking about a cash flow is how much money it costs you every day, 365 days out of the year, to meet your obligations. You take those dollars that you have to invest. The land, we took over 40 years at the going interest rate now. The short-term chattels, we took over five or ten years, depending on how they're done. Again, times the interest rate, the going rate on that interest today. And what that farm has to produce every day for a young farmer who would buy that operation, every time his feet hit the floor in the morning, it cost him $368.77. That don't include if you lose a sow pigging or any other thing. That is when your feet hit the floor in the morning. In the state of Nebraska, on an average 640 acre farm, a corn and beef operation. The land investment is $615,522. The machinery investment is $184,800. Improvements, $23,394. And livestock, $9,190. With a total investment of $832,000. $906. Figuring the same cash flow, taking the principal and your interest, dividing by 365 days on all your notes, the daily cash flow needs for that operation is $376.82 every day. Not five days a week, not 40 hours a week, but all day, every day, all year long. We also found out, according to this study and talking to the young farmers, that the young farmers today, in aggregate, are in debt eight times more than their 1950 counterparts. 
eight times more. In 1972, there was the greatest influx in the last decade of young farmers into agriculture because prices were higher. They came in, they got started, and what happened? For a while, the bottom fell out of it. Today, 15% of the farmers in the United States are under 35 years old. But since 1973, now remember in 72, I said 15, that we had the greatest influx of young farmers we'd had in the last decade. Since 1973 to 1977, the aggregate commodity prices have dropped 5%, while production costs have gone up 23%. And then they wonder how come we're in a price crisis, a price squeeze. There is nobody can operate that way. No company, nowhere. In 1978, USDA says we've got two million farmers. They are projecting that by 1980, and this comes out of the same study I was talking about, there will be a million and a half, 500,000 less. We have lost almost 2,000 farmers a week since 1950. 2,000 farms a week. 2,000 farm families a week. So what's the answer? How do you get around the cash flow? How do we handle it? How do we make it work? There's only one way, and that is to get cost of production for our commodities to retire that debt. Because what's going to happen? Take yourself as an example. You bought that land at three, four hundred dollars an acre, and it's worth two thousand. Tax-wise, what can you do if you want to sell it? You can take twenty-nine percent, right? You take the rest in paper. Twenty-nine percent. What's going to happen to us? We buy that land at $3,000 an acre, $2,000 an acre. What happens when we get to the point to where we want to sell it? If inflation keeps going, what's the tax structure going to be then? What's that land going to be worth? Instead of 29%, what are we going to be able to take when we get ready to retire? 2%? I don't know. The only way that we can stop it is to retire the debt and pass on, instead of paper and inflation, an operation that somebody can buy, that he can raise his family on, that he can be proud to live on, and do what he wants to do and has a right to do. How else are we going to do it? In the last month, we have started to put together across this country a two-county structure, putting a young farmer over every two counties in the United States. And when we left the home office, we had about 350 counties covered. We will be recruiting at this convention. We will go out of this convention and have training sessions with those people. Because all we have to do in this organization now is make contacts and make them count. The structure is there. And we'll talk more about that, the young farmer structure in the meeting Thursday night. I want to spend the rest of my time talking about something else. <clears throat> I want to talk about
pride and moral responsibility of the people in this room. You know, we're all so involved in what's going on in this organization that biggest part of us forgot where we came from, what we started out to do, and where we're headed. About three months ago, we were sitting in the home office in a staff meeting one night, and I asked, when the organization went into collective bargaining, I said, how much money did you have when you started collective bargaining in 1958? And I almost fell over. I was told that you had, at that convention, a total of about $880 in the bank. I couldn't believe it. Where are you at now? Twenty years later, you have a structure across this country that if my calculations are right, are around $150 million that's been put into it, including legislative programs in Washington and every state, collective bargaining programs in commodities, plus all the other actions that you've had. So last year, you have moved $750 million worth of commodities through this organization. If you take Fortune's 500 listing of companies, you would rank 341st in 500. And you have an operating budget of somewhere around $17 million. To start out with $880 and a dream, it's unbelievable. Nobody, nobody has ever done anything like that on this earth. And you've done all that and also due to people who didn't believe as strong as you that are in here and a lot of other ones out in the country, you gave up $50 million worth of dues. You've been in struggle in a lawsuit that has cost you almost $7 million in direct cost alone. $7 million. That don't include the indirect cost of all the time that when we could be putting commodities together, we had to do something to keep that lawsuit, send people to Kansas City, spend time on figuring out how we were going to manipulate and move around the opposition in the courtroom. Besides that, you got in an entanglement with the IRS, right? And if that wasn't enough, the SEC took out after you. All of them, the last three, bent on your destruction, and you're still here. You should be the proudest people that ever walked in this country. Yeah, and then once in a while, I hear somebody say, yeah, but I'm getting awful tired. Well, you ain't tired yet. Because you in this room 
have got a moral obligation. Like it or not, you're it. You have got to take this organization where it's at right now and push it one more time because you've got a whole generation of young farmers out there and they showed us last winter that they need something. And we've got to bring these two together and make a cohesive unit. And like it or not, we've got to bring those young farmers into this organization make them part of the NFO, and like it or not, it's your job and you're going to accept the responsibility to do it, not because you want to, but because you're here. You have to go that much further, people. And I know 20 years is a long time. But this organization, and some of you in here have got a lot more time in at being a parent than I do, but if you look at it, it's just like raising a kid. It was barned in 58 in St. Joe, Missouri, collective bargaining. You went through all the turmoils, all the good times, all the bad times. Sometime you got so disgusted, you didn't know what to do with it, but you're here. And it's 20 years old. Now you've got that far to go before it's mature and it'll take it off on its own. And you can pass it to somebody else. You can pass the leadership and the responsibility to the young farmers but you have got to take them by the hand and show them what they have to do and why it has to be done and don't let them forget what it took to get you here. We have to be reminded of that too. And it'll start Monday morning when you leave. You get home you're either going to start to bridge that gap or you're not. And I can't make you do it. But when you hit your home county line, you start looking at the abandoned farms. You start looking at the abandoned churches. The one rundown schoolhouses. The businesses that got boards on them. Where did all those people go? A lot of them in this part of Missouri are right here. Look out of that motel window tonight. Whatever you do starting Monday morning, you're either going to give your children and your grandchildren a chance to stay <clears throat> on that land or you're going to sentence them to what you see out that motel window. That ain't a very pretty sight, is it? There's nothing else I can tell you, people. You've got to make up the mind to go that last mile and help us get the young farmers involved because, believe it or not, we need this organization eight times worse than you did because that ha is how much further down we are than you were when we started. You're going to make the decision. And you're going to make it from the time you hit your county line till you drive in your driveway. I hope you make the right one. Thank you very much.